Good morning. I'm Reverend Debbie Hasdorf, and I'm the pastor here at Parkview United Church of Christ. And on behalf of the whole congregation, I want to welcome you here today to this service of worship. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It's good to have you. So let's begin our service today with a prayer. Gracious God, gentle in your power and strong in your tenderness, you have brought us forth from the womb of your being and breathed into us the breath of life. We know that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from you. Feed our deep hungers with the living bread that you give us. May Jesus promise where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them, be fulfilled in us. Make us a joyful company of your people so that with the faithful in every place and time, we may praise and honor you. God Most High. Amen. And now we're going to have an opening hymn, and it is To You, O God, All Creatures Sing. And Heather Cogswell is going to lead us.
Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, the 21st to the 28th verses. It's called The Man with an Unclean Spirit, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and he taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with this, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. In my seminary New Testament class, we were given an odd but ultimately mind-changing and heart-changing assignment. We were asked to take the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and take all the pericopes, all the small sections of the story, or the ones that are story or the ones that are history or the ones that are teachings, to take them all apart like a deck of cards and to sort them and to put them back together as our own gospel the gospel according to Debbie. And the question is, what stories would you keep and what stories would you leave out? Where would you start and where would you end? What would be the story of Jesus that you would tell with your gospel? At that time in my life, I was a pretty confirmed skeptic. And so I dreaded, I, de I decided that I would construct my gospel without any miracle stories. If it wasn't possible or probable, whatever that means, then it couldn't, if it couldn't actually have happened, then I left it out. Water into wine, loaves and fishes, healing stories. I understood Jesus to be a good guy, a gifted teacher, a critic of the social order, and a prophet of a better world to come. He hung out with the losers, the unimportant, the shunned. He was a man of incredible courage who stood up to power and died for it. Anyway, there was a lot I believed about Jesus, mostly with my brain, but I just couldn't believe the miracle stories. It turns out that even as a graduate student, I was a biblical literalist. I first read the words as history or as a report or witness to the life of a man who was born and died in Palestine around 36 BCE. But the longer I studied the Bible, the longer I preached from the Bible, the longer I read the Bible, the clearer that it became to me that the Bible, the Gospels, were never meant to be read as a history or as a, journal, or as a journalist. History and journalism report small T truths, and the story of Jesus point us to a big T truth, the truth of God's love and God's justice and God's peace. It doesn't matter, matter whether the miracles happened or not. What matters is that the stories point us towards the meaning of the life of Jesus. And that is what we do together week after week. We read the stories of Jesus to understand what they mean and what they teach us about his life and his death and what those things teach us about God. Today we have a miracle story from the Gospel of Mark. We're coming in at the 21st verse of the first chapter, and already a whole lot has happened. There is no nativity story in Mark, so Mark begins with the baptism of Jesus by John. Then Jesus goes into the wilderness and is tempted, and then John is arrested. Jesus goes to Galilee to begin his teaching and preaching, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe in the good news. And then Jesus goes and calls Simon and Andrew and James and John, and they leave their fishing nets and they follow him. And we're only 20 verses into the first chapter of Mark. 
Jesus and the newly called disciples travel to Capernaum, and they go to the synagogue because it's the Sabbath. And Jesus begins to teach. And in his voice and in his words and in his presence, there is an authority, a truth. And then, and then having heard all of this, they are gathered in wonder, and then a man stands up, a man who scares them with his wild energy and his loud shouts. What are you doing here, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? You're the Holy One, and you're here to break us apart. And Jesus looks him in the eye and sees, sees into his tortured soul. And he says to the voices in the man's head, quiet, get out of him. And the man drops to the floor and his body spasms and finally he calms. The people in the synagogue are amazed, asking who is this man? He calmed that crazy guy the voices have been silenced, and the man is healed. And the people ran from the synagogue, buzzing to tell the story of this man who could quiet demons. This little story is called the story of a man with an unclean spirit, but other versions of the Bible call it the casting out of demons. I'd be curious to know your take on demons, on the demonic, Across Christian history, there is a deep tradition of understanding there to be a supernatural battle between good and evil, between God and Satan, that is playing on all around us. It's what people mean when they talk about the dark forces and the forces of light. It's what we mean when we say someone is possessed and it's what happens at an exorcism. There are Christians who believe that God and Satan are in this eternal war to claim our souls. It's this dualism, good versus evil, right versus wrong, the godly versus the demonic. Most of the early Christians would have understood that to be the way that the world worked. The man in the synagogue on that Sabbath was thought to be possessed by a demon. So Jesus, having told them that the time has come, the kingdom is near, repent and believe. Now he is going to show them, show the scribes in the synagogue, show them that he is sent from God and that even the demons recognize him. By the authority vested in him by God, he can call out the demonic. He's not telling them, he is showing them that he comes in the name of the Lord. Now, at this point, many preachers have devolved into interpretations of, de as, of a demon as being mental illness or epilepsy, which would really make this a healing story. But in the first century, the listeners of this story knew nothing, nothing about the science of mental illness or brain science. A first century audience would have understood the demonic as an alien, supernatural force and it's not necessary for us to understand this text to explain away their world view. But we can share with these early Christians an epiphany. This story reveals to us, as it did for the first century church, who Jesus is. This is what a Messiah looks like. We can read this story through first century eyes, through 21st century eyes, and recognize that demons are anything that has power over a human being. Anything that has power over a human being that is not of God. A demon is something that is keeping you from God, keeping you from living a full, meaningful life. When considered through this lens, it seems to me that we all know something about the demonic. We know what it means to experience, experience ourselves as under the control of something that is not of God. Anyone who has battled with willpower knows what it is to struggle with resistance. People who live with depression or bipolar disease or other mental illnesses know what it means to battle an invisible force. People we love and even some of us have battled the demon of addiction 
drugs, alcohol, porn, food, materialism, so many forces that can grab a hold of our souls and make, take us to dark places. Our demons do not need to be supernatural or embodied spirits. Our demons are a part of our very nature. And like the man with the unclean spirit, few of us can defeat our demons alone. The sto this is the story of the, of the Messiah coming to save, to save the man, to save us from our worst selves. And there are unclean spirits that we must confront. Couldn't we see racism or sexism or white supremacy as demons? Things, demons that separate us from God, from God's love. These isms are invisible forces that we were taught, things that we learned, ways of seeing the world that we inherited that are eating our souls and destroying God's creation and God's beloved children. In the not too distant past, you would hear people say, I don't see color, I'm not a racist. Now that's a way of saying that racism doesn't exist. This form of evil, race, this, the demonic power of racism, is systemic and it is institutional and it is a collective sin. Process theology, the kind of theology that I like best, teaches us that evil, evil is caused by bad choices which accumulate and are passed on generationally until they become so big that they are invisible and assumed to be acceptable. This is another way to think about evil, the consequences of mistakes, selfishness, prejudice, sins, pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, sloth, multiplied generationally. The forces in the world that empower unjust systems. They come across time, they, we, we carry them with us, and we send them with our contributions. Our religious rituals across time have understood the power of evil. In the baptism ritual of the United Church of Christ, we ask the person to be baptized, do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? That language has always seemed very archaic to me. It's kind of old-fashioned, but it is there. It is in the liturgy. Do you renounce the powers of evil? Evil is real. Jesus could see that the power of evil had a grip on the man with the unclean spirit and that something bigger than his will and beyond his understanding was tormenting him. Jesus called out the demon itself. He silenced it and he rebuked it. Jesus came to this man to demonstrate God's love for him that could break open the power of the demonic and bring forth new life. When we look at a miracle story like the man with the unclean spirit and ask, could this have really happened? We kind of miss the point of the story. We miss the big T truth that's embedded in this story. And the big T truth is that Jesus was sent by God to break the bonds of evil. Evils that hurt us, that hurt others, that cause suffering and destroy creation. We need not be held captive by demons. We can call them out. We can name them. We can ask for help. These are the steps of repentance. But because of the ministry of Jesus Christ, we know and we can trust that God is working through us and around us and between us to break the bonds of evil, to silence the demons. We are in a time, a time when many demons are being exposed and we are being asked to think again about the presence of evil in our lives, in our society, all around us. We're in this long season of racial reckoning when we are learning to look again at our past and to see the ways in which we have contributed to racism, contributed to the oppression of other people. We're in a time when the Me Too movement has come, come into being and we are 
learning to look at our past and to think about the ways in which women have been used, used because of their vulnerability and because of their desire to succeed. We're in a time when we are working to save the earth from climate change and global warming. And we're needing to come to terms with the evil that we have done to our planet, the ways in which we have abused the gift that God has given us. We are in a fight to stop a virus run rampant, the evil of suffering that comes from the virus. And it has exposed the inequities that have led to poverty. The people who are most affected and most seriously affected by the virus are the people who live in poverty. The demons are loud and they are strong and often they seem to have us in their grip. Can we ever imagine a society that does not experience these particular demons? But the thing in the story that is most important is that Jesus does not, does not ignore the demons. He exposes the demons. He calls them out. He called the demon out of the man. And we too can call them out. This is how change happens. This is how you calm the demons. You call them out. You bring them into the light and you look at them and you acknowledge their existence, and then you have taken away their power. The demonic. Do you believe in the demonic? It's something to think about. Amen. Like a feather riding on the river, passing by, then floating to the dark a single moment having been delivered and even in reunion there is parting a circle round and round made up of memories and as we finish then again we start and at the end we're back at the beginning and even in reunion there is parting like watercolors bleed red into blue one day into another Love will travel with you. And like a feather riding on the river. And as we journey, friendships of the heart are carried close within till the time we meet again. And even in reunion there is parting. They're carried close within till the time we meet again. And even in reunion there is parting. And now we come to the time in our service when we share with each other our prayer concerns. We talk about people who are in our lives, who we love and care about, or we know, who are um, suffering a loss, who are suffering from an illness, who are um, in pain for some reason, and who need God's healing touch. And then we also lift, lift up people on our hearts who are having um, good times, who are experiencing life's milestones, who are feeling blessed, and we give thanks for them and for the joy that God brings to them. And we do this together because together we are God's people and we bear each other's burdens and we share each other's joys. So today we have some things to be in prayer about. Didn't get any prayer concerns this week, so I'm just going to lift up some things that I think are important. Um, 
first of all, I want to give thanks for all of the people who have been able to get vaccinated during this last couple of weeks. It's amazing on um, the number of people just here at church who I've heard from who have been vaccinated or who have an appointment. So um, let us never forget what a miracle this is, that um, the scientists were able to come up with a vaccine, we were able to find a way to distribute it, and we were able to pull together to get to this point. So um, we give thanks for the miracle of the vaccines. We hold you in the light of Christ. And then I need to light a candle. We all need to light a candle to remember all the people who have lost their lives in this, um, this horrific pandemic. Um, over um, 430,000 people have died um, in this pandemic. Um, it's just, it's unthinkable, um, so many people. And it's hidden from us because, because we cannot see it. Um, it's spread across our nation, spread across our world in a way in which we cannot um, not even comprehend the enormity of what's happening. So um, today I want to pray for everyone who is um, struggling with the virus, everyone who has a family member who has the virus, especially prayers for people who are in the hospital, people who are on ventilators, people who love people who are ill. Um, we pray for all the people whose lives have been affected by the COVID virus. We hold you in the light of Christ. And then as Fred Rogers used to say, whenever you're having a hard time, look for the helpers. And there are so many people in our society who are stepping up right now to um, do jobs they never thought they'd have to do in ways they never thought they would have to. Um, and just stepping up to try to um, bring people through a hard time. So I want to lift up um, all the people in our hospitals who are working so hard um, to help people to heal. I want to pray for all of our teachers who are working so hard to, um, to create a safe space for our children to learn. I want to pray for all the families with children at home who are trying to do what's best for their kids and make hard decisions, um, who are often watching their kids while they're working from home. I want to lift up all the... Um, all the people who are helping people out, taking groceries, giving them rides somewhere, sending a card, making a phone call, all the people who are helping to keep us connected and to keep us um, known in a time when we can feel very alone. There's so many people who are helping in so many ways, and I think that one of the ways in which we can get through this hard time is to open our eyes and see the ways in which God is made real in our lives by the people around us. So for all the people who are helping, we hold you in the light of Christ. And then I want to light a candle um, for our church, Parkview Church family, for all the people who are a part of this community, all the people who, um, who've walked through these doors or who've watched us online, who, um, who believe like we believe in an inclusive, loving, caring community, a place where people are known for who they are and accepted as they are, um, a place where we do everything we can to support one another through all of life's trials and all of life's blessings. So the thank, a prayer of thanks, thankfulness for Parkview, for our Parkview family, and for the ways we work well together when we work together. For the church here at Parkview, we hold you in the light of Christ. Let us be together in prayer. Loving God, be with us through all the unknown days lying before us, days when the black of night set settles early in the west, when the strong white of winter comes from the north, days when we look for the red of sunrise in the east, days when the yellow noonday lingers in the south. Touch us that we may trust you and be strong so that we may grow in union with all our sisters and brothers so that we may see more deeply into ourselves. We seek a vision from you, a vision of mystery, a vision of ourselves and the love that you have for us. May we answer, your tr on may we answer you honest and true, generous and brave. Help us understand that for those who are faithful to you, Life is not ended, but only changed. Help us to join together with all you have created to say, great and powerful is our God. God fills all heaven and earth with beauty. 
We have deep hope because God has promised everlasting life to God's people. And we pray all this in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the end of our time together today. Um, I'm so glad that you are here with us. I, um, I hope you feel connected to your church and you know how much you are missed if you're at home and how happy I am and how happy we are to see each other when we actually can gather. Your church leadership is at work. We have lots of good things happening here and we want you to know that Parkview's hearts are open. So now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and grant you God's peace. Amen.